Thank you, Chuck. It's really a pleasure to be here, to be among all of you, because uh, this is going to be an exciting couple of days. Um, Chuck didn't mention I, we were also together in a trip to El Salvador a few years ago. And uh, watching him in action, both publicly and privately, uh, in El Salvador was uh, a real eye-opener uh, for me as well. Violence prevention, as we all know, is crucial to the region, particularly in Central America and the Caribbean. And my re brief remarks are going to concentrate on Central America and the Caribbean, even though it says Latin America <laughs> there. But in the countries of Latin America where you have such a problem, everything that I think we're going to cover, uh, see covered today, um, um, applies. Violence prevention is crucial for the United States of America. I come from Washington where I live. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. Um, long diplomatic career, lived in the region, dealt with the issues in Washington. Um, and from that experience, I would like to ask three basic questions and give three basic perspectives, all in the same, um, as this conference begins. First question is, just what is going on in Central America and the Caribbean and why? The second is, why are these realities important to the United States? And what is the United States doing to address them? And third, what can an important public university, which calls itself a new American university, do what should it do to address these realities, these matters that affect the lives of many citizens of the region, most citizens of the region, the region, and by extension, the lives of peoples in the United States and across the world. Indeed, Jonathan Capel has made the point that this is really on ASU's agenda. This is ASU's agenda, and that is welcome. First, the response to what is going on in the region, in Central America and the Caribbean, is quite frankly devastating. The two regions, Central America and the Caribbean, each fill the lists of the most violent countries in the world. Statistically, if you just take one measurement, most homicides per 100,000, the list begins Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, Venezuela. Venezuela is in a special category because of the last 20 years of Venezuelan history, and that's another subject for another conference, which I, and I'd be happy to address all of this <laughs> uh, in the interactions. But among the top 20, add to that list Jamaica, Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, and the smaller Caribbean countries, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, and of course, Mexico. We'll give it geographically for a moment. So, uh, why? We all know the reasons why. In no particular order, and but this conference will address all of them, I'm sure. Poverty, lack of jobs, lack of economic opportunity, most importantly for young people who, lacking work opportunities, often find themselves in the informal economy and absorb into the drug gang world. <clears throat> Poor education, the demand and supply of the drug trade. Notice I said the demand and the supply of the drug trade. Because there is a problem in all of these countries because of the demand that comes from the United States of America. And we as a country and a society almost refuse, in my mind, to deal <clears throat> with it in a convincing way. Now, kind of an indictment of our political class, but, and maybe our whole society. Um, in addition to that, uh, you have uh, in, the, in the area, corruption and impunity and police and judicial systems that citizens distrust. Second, why are these realities important to us Americans? And I'm uh, 
and to our government. And I'm going to give a Washington perspective on this because I live in Washington and as a career diplomat dealt with these issues all the time. Well, because when we include Mexico in what has just been described, uh, it adds up to geographic proximity. Geography matters. This region is the neighborhood. Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. It's not our backyard. That is uh, an infuriating term. It's the neighborhood. Now, uh, we have even called the Caribbean our third border. As, if you look at it in terms of a neighborhood, we want the region, the neighborhood, to be safe, secure, friendly, prosperous, with democratic values, just like our own. Um, for us, the issues, the problems, and the opportunities for cooperation are, of course, linked to, ge uh, to geographic proximity. And they are the movement of people, migration, family ties, economic realities of trade and commerce and investment, natural disasters, health issues, environment issues, shared natural resources, the pool of drug consumption and the push of supply and transit, and the crime issues. The movements of goods, and trafficking, trafficking in persons, DIP, international crime syndicates, international terrorism. All of those things. We know that. And all of these things, I assume, are going to be dealt with in today's, in the conference of the next two days. Then there's a question of what is the United States doing to address all of this? And Here's a factoid. The population of Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, together, around 209 million, are more than half of the population of the United States, 325 million. So that, in percentage terms, that's about 64%. So 64% of the population of the neighborhood, uh, 64, uh, the, the population of the neighborhood is 64% of the population of the United States. And, um, and the population of Canada is about 35 million. So, uh, again, you come back to geography and proximity. And the question is, well, what's Washington doing about it in, in a political way? There's some good news. Uh, there has been a consistent bipartisan partisan policy approach with different names in different administrations and different emphases in different administrations to deal with the two regions. And it continues in the administration of President Trump. Now, I would say that the energy and the priorities and the attention in comparison with other parts of the world has largely been inadequate. The most recent manifestation of it is the fact that our president is not going to go to the Summit of the Americas next weekend in Lima, where he would have a chance to interact with all the leaders of the hemisphere, and that's probably the main value of the Summit of the Americas these days, because of Syrian problems. Now, that's just not very believable, but it happens. And I'm afraid people from the region are not surprised by this sort of thing. The fact that the vice president is going isn't bad, really, because I think he'll do a lot of listening, which he should do. The consistent themes for years, since the, you know, since um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, have been, and before the fall of the Berlin Wall, that's another issue in history. <laughs> which is fascinating. The themes have been democracy, development, and security. In the Clinton administration, the emphasis was trade, the grand strategy, NAFTA, plus education and health, and hopefully a free trade area of the Americas, which our friends from the Southern Cone, particularly Mercosur, didn't really cotton to, for Brazil reasons in my mind. Another subject, too, for another one. <laughs> Uh, plus the summit process, which the United States launched, and disaster relief, which is an integral part of what the United States does in the hemisphere. 
Then came the Bush administration and bilateral trade pacts, the Merida Initiative with Mexico of shared resources and attention, which is a good program and continues, traditional health, education, and training, and of course, disaster relief. Come the Obama administration, and the strategy is called, quote, the U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America, close quote, with three poles, promote prosperity, strengthen governance, and improve security, which are another way of democracy, development, and security. So names change administration after administration. Um, and uh, in the Obama administration, there was something that the Centrals, what Central Americans put together, called uh, the Alliance for Prosperity, and the goal was to attract a lot, billions of dollars of investment and aid working with the Inter-American Development Bank, an objective not quite realized. Comes the Trump administration, the same three polls haven't changed, but a, a name change. Instead of what the Obama administration called it, the Trump administration is calling it U.S. strategy in Central America, as opposed to U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America. I don't understand why a change was needed. I think the only reason is a new administration likes to have new names for, for policies. Uh, plus, nowadays, the notion of burden sharing, bringing in Mexico, Colombia, Canada, Chile, and the private sector. Good ideas, but not exactly new ideas. But let us remember the old maxim, policies without funding or illusions. There's another thing to remember about uh, the way the United States does the development business, and that is something called pipelines. And people from the U.S. government here who have worked in the U.S. government understand what pipelines are all about. And usually in our system, it takes two fiscal years to obligate funds, and usually four years to expend them. So bottom line, there's money there. I learned just last week, nosing around in the State Department, that uh, the people there are saying, you know, funding from this, uh, the, 19, the 2016 fiscal year and the 2017 fiscal year, 685 million in one and 615 in the other. The 615 one was under the Trump administration, was reduced by President Trump from 660 to 6015. It's there, it hasn't been expended. They're still deciding on how to do it. So uh, the money is there. That includes money dispersed through the U.S. Agency for International Development and through the State Department, the Bureau of International Narcotics, um, INL. And, uh, and of course, they focus in, and there's shared because aid and INL do law enforcement to confront gangs, narcotics, arms trafficking, organized crime, build institutional capacity in law enforcement and injustice, and uh, economic and social programming, community police, at-risk youth, etc., etc. All the things that we're going to hear about in this conference. And in the Caribbean, we have the Caribbean Basin Security Initiative, CARSI, C-A-R-S-I, uh, which uh, has received over the years 400, between 400 and 500 million since 2010. And the 2018 budget is um, about 55 million, which if you divide the, the eight, nine years by the number of years you get in the 50s for the region. So the money is there, that's the point. Now, what should an important public university, ASU, be, dealing, be doing to deal with these realities in the spirit and in the context of the new American university. My response is, and I submit it to you all, is do international development in Central America and the Caribbean. Work with partners, share knowledge, and do knowledge enterprise. That's what ASU has been doing what Chuck Katz has been doing for years. That's what Dean Capel has been talking about. You just got to keep doing it and uh, don't look back, just look forward. Play to your strengths that are on display here. 
ASU has all of them, for all the areas identified, by the United States government. Remember, what are the three poles identified in the Trump administration? Promote prosperity, strengthen governments, improve security. Okay, that's what the U.S. government wants to do. That's what the money is on the table for. Just do it. But one other thing to note, and we've heard reference to it today, and I picked this up last week, again, nosing around, which is one of the things I do from time to time. That's probably the value of a retired U.S. diplomat. I, most of these young people that work these issues now used to work for me at some point, so I, so I know. There are special needs in terms of performance measurements, and I heard people in the State Department talk about this. The metrics of what they do as projects are developed during and in their conclusion. Did we achieve our goals? How do we know? How do we measure it? How do we explain it? And they need that expertise. They don't have it. That's where your research comes in. That's where your knowledge comes in. That's where your depth comes in. And I'll tell you why. Because these people who work diplomacy, less so, you, less so the United States Agency for International Development. They have a lot more people who stay for a longer period of time, but not exclusively. People come in, have the experience from the field, go out to other assignments. They stay for two years, three years, four years. Uh, we do have a, some civil service employees who really know the stuff, but they need the ability to measure, to evaluate, because the Congress has to, they have to explain to the Congress, well, we, what they've accomplished or not accomplished with that funding. So uh, the funding is there, is my message. It'll be there for the next several years. Uh, and uh, what is needed from you all? Research, what you know about innovative models, what should your input be in action proposals, and of course, information sharing. So look for every opportunity based on your strength, on your smarts, and on your records to just go for it. I can't leave without saying something about the political moment. Because if you come from Washington, there's a political moment. And uh, it has to do with what is being said about Mexico. But really, if you're talking about Mexico, you're talking about Central America, you're talking about the Caribbean, too. You're talking about your neighborhood. Uh, and it's a quote from my friend Bill Brownfield, who retired from the State Department recently, the head of INL. And Bill said, when he was asked a question by the Washington Post, he said the following, which I think... Uh, should be shared. Quote, as we deal with the reality of political campaigns and elections and the inevitable rhetoric they produce, let us remember we are cooperating, he referred to Mexico, I would say with Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean, because it is in our national interest. I would regret as a retired official if we allowed such rhetoric to undercut or end cooperation that is delivering real value to Mexico and real value to the United States. We all have our work cut out for us. Thanks, Jeff.